Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. Today I got the motherboard here that needs some maintenance. So the story here is that I won an auction. So I bought this motherboard with a CPU included for around $11, something like that, US dollars, around 11 euros. And the reason I bought it was the fact that it was advertised as defective, the motherboard, but the CPU itself was advertised as an Atheron XP M, so that's a mobile part, a 2400 plus, uh, and I have verified the number here. So the part number here is is correct for uh, an Atlon XP mobile, Atlon XP M, 2400 plus, and the stepping is supposed to be pretty good. I don't, I'm not sure if it's a top rated stepping or not, but uh, depending who you ask, it matters or it doesn't. But Anyway, this is a 1.35 volt part, so it's, uh, as far as I can find, the best uh, rated 2400 plus mobile. Uh, there are higher voltage parts, and a lower voltage at the same frequency would indicate a better bin. So this is a Barton core also, so we got the big L2 cache. And like I said, everything was sold as defective, basically, because the caps are bad on the motherboard. If it's not obvious, so they have uh, basically popped uh, the seal at the bottom. So they haven't cracked on the top, but the bottom is uh, has left the barrel, so to speak. I think uh, from the owner's description, this was used as an HTPC computer at some point, and then put in a box, and then the cap leaked over the years. So I don't see why the CPU would wouldn't work. The motherboard. Who knows? So I would actually like to try this CPU out, clean it up, uh, mount it in a working board and see if we have a working CPU because if we have that, the CPU would probably be like $50-$60 on eBay and if I can get it for $11 that's a good deal. And uh, I do have uh, caps for the motherboard, I managed to find all that I need in my box, just, just barely. Mm -hmm. Came down to the, I think... Uh, one version here, it was just enough, I think these uh, exactly what I need. But you should be able to recap this board and figure out if it works or not. If that works, that's a bonus. And uh, I have already hate for a Soltec, and we can go into that later why, but uh, this particular Soltec board actually has a 12 volt connector. And I checked and it goes to the MOSFETs over here, so that seems to be an actual 12 volt powered board. So that's nice because you can use a modern power supply. So yeah, let's get this CPU out, test it, and if it works, we can put it away because I have a future plan for this. And then we can recap the whole board and try the board. So I have this uh, DFI LAN party board, it's an Enforce 2 Ultra 400. Uh, I repaired it and recapped it because I got it. Uh, it had some PCB damage and stuff, so who knows. But yeah, for suiciding you can get insane scores on this one. And it was used for LN12 clock, I think, from the previous owner. Got it from. There was two of these boards. Uh, out of four, two are completely dead. I was told and thrown away. I got one of the still like rescue that you could rescue. That CPU just dropped straight in there. So it's, uh, it's not a bad board. It should be more than good enough to test the CPU and also bin it later. So that's the plan, I can bin the CPU later, so I know kind of a core clock it can run and so on. Because this uh, this board accepts pretty much any socket A CPU. So let's some paste on that and a heat sink. Uh, this board is also pretty stupid for the calves are always in the way. And they have SMD stuff around all the holes for the, if you have a true hole mounted uh, heat sink or water block. So it's really easy to damage this board if you're not careful. So. I tend to use this heatsink, it's a more or less a stock heatsink with copper base, but it will work fine for a CPU like this, or just testing. Mm. And the clip is actually not that hard for being more or less stock. So let's get this hooked up with a graphics card and a power supply. Let's power it on. So I paused here, using the pause button, so we've got the mobile, 
mobile AMD Athlon at 800 megahertz. Current CPU ID 06A0. We are in the BIOS here. I can use my capture card here actually because I got the DVI port on this card. So frequency isn't a problem. And the bus is set to 133 here, which is what this CPU has. Uh, and it's running at 800. I think that's a multiplier of 5. V core is apparently 1.5. Um, uh, th I checked the part, it's supposed to be 1.35 according to CPU world. So, and I checked the bridge too, the actual physical bridge, and it's also 1.35. So I think that's just a motherboard doing funny things, but it doesn't matter. It's uh, it has the same vCore tolerance as our desktop part, so 1.65 is essentially stock. It can run up to 1.75, I would say at least. So we can obviously set the multiplier, which should be 13 and a half. I'm not sure if I can select that high. It depends on the board. Uh, because it's got an upper range and a lower range, I think the lower range is up to 13, or if it's 12 and a half. But we can try 13 here, and uh, restart and see what happens. If we can get the speed up here. 1,703, which is a little bit lower than I'd expect. Uh, now we need 13 and a half. We can also see if we can do CPU voltage manually to 135. If it's not stable, we'll probably find out pretty soon. And it's posting, so that's a good sign. 224 plus rating. By setting. Yeah, voltage is correct. Bus, everything is correct now. So let's. Uh, Load up Windows. So yeah, I'm running Windows 9.8. It's usually my via board, Pinson 3 via board uh, hard drive, but uh, I installed the Enforce drivers on it. I would use Windows 2000 really for a CPU and motherboard like this, but uh, I didn't have a hard drive prepared with 2000. Anyway, we are in Windows, so that's interesting. I haven't crashed out or anything. Yeah, I've been repairing a graphics card and testing on this motherboard, that's why I had a DFI LAN party out. Um, yeah, I am the Atom XP Mobile Barton 1.24. Yeah, the voltage is I set the manual obviously. But it should be that default 1800. The thing is, this is obviously unlocked CPU, so you can run much higher bus, and that's that's what the, I'm primarily doing. But with this stepping, I should probably be able to hit like 2.3, 2.4 gear minimum, maybe even more. It depends on how much voltage you want to give it. I'm just gonna run a little bit of Prime 95 here. To, if it's actually a 1.5 volt port, really shouldn't be because everything I checked says it's not. Uh, you can decode the bridge bridges like where they burned them or not, and it came out in 1.35 on the CPU and also check other CPUs uh, with the same model number and I have the same I just think it's the motherboard that is a little bit confused but I mean 1.5 doesn't hurt the CPU just makes it draw more power than needed but it's prime 95 a little bit here so it should be a good CPU I don't see any problems here obvious problems I have to test it more thoroughly later but that's gonna take me days to bin it properly so let's stop here and assume it's a good CPU the board is on the board heater here, just for heating a little bit. So the CPU checked out fine, so that was a worth the investment, uh, just that. But it would be nice if we could save this board. And the seller actually sent me a message a day or two later, basically said uh, he hoped I could fix the board. So that's always fun. So like I said, I think this board is uh, perfectly fine other, other than the caps. So it's always a bit tricky to find a good resting spot for the board uh, on a hot plate. It's too small and uh, really not made to have the board like this. It's supposed to go in between here and another bracket over here. Uh, but anyways, so the, the hot plate is, uh, I'm trying to hit like 80C on the board. It was between 90 and 50 before. 
I'm 49 over there. But that was with the word other way around. It's actually dropping here in the middle now. It's around 70 there. Around 50 over here. 65. 63. I'm just cleaning my iron. And I'm gonna add some solder here. We're gonna start on a cap over here. I've got the widest tip I have. I think it's 4.6 millimeters. Because the the, the the center, like the the the, the, the these two legs are five millimeters apart, so you can hit both of them at the same time. It both helps with getting heat into the board, but it also helps the soldering because when they both uh, go, both legs uh, get uh, melted, the uh, solder, they can fall out if the legs aren't bent. So. I find that uh, waiting a little while, maybe I'll do a count of 10, will help. So it should be one hole, it looks clean from here, but it's an angle for me, so. That looks, they're both clean, sometimes it's hard to see because the solder is the social mirror could look like it's not the hole or the other way around but uh, we got it I usually don't talk when I'm working on a board because I haven't mastered the Lewis Rossman skill of doing that but uh, I have a certain hate for Soltec this, uh, this, this brand it's not the board's particular fault but uh, yeah my first not my, technically my second motherboard, my, my first like computer built myself was uh, based on a Soltec board. And I picked it for a number of reasons, uh, it was uh, in 2001, so I picked it because it had DDR memory, and I wanted that, and I wanted a lot of it. And DDR was actually very cheap back then, it cost like $60 for 256 megabytes of DDR, 266 megahertz. So you can get three sticks for like $200, which in today's money is obviously like maybe $400. But back then that was a ton of memory for a desktop, like most people, even a little bit later, like a year or two later, still had 256. So it was a ton of memory. And so uh, I wanted the, the latest standard and I want a lot of it. So I excluded some Asus board because they had two dim slots and so on. And uh, the store I bought uh, everything at actually used Soltec for the builder set. So they were like, it's super good board, go with Soltec. So I did. Uh, and one reason I picked that particular Soltec board was that it was advertised as Athlon XP ready and Athlon XP was like two months out. Um, technically the mobile version was already out, so it shouldn't be an issue, so there were biases and everything. So I bought the board with an Athlon Thunderbird 1400 that cost $180, $170, they were really cheap at the end, obviously, but, uh, because I think the P4 two gears was out, and so on. And even the Northwoods, maybe. So I bought the board, and then before buying the CPU two months later, Soltec came out and said, like, the BIOS patch won't work, the BIOS file won't work, because there's a resistor value strong on the motherboard. Basically, we made a boo-boo, but it's Amy's fault. So um, that was fun. So they had this program where you could send your board in, and I would... Uh, fix it, but you, you would get a refurb back from someone else's motherboard. The problem was that they wanted 800 Swedish kronor for it, so that's like $80. And the board was like $160 new, 1600 Swedish kronor, something like that. And the thing is in Sweden you have like a three year, you have this warranty, but then no matter what the, the, the maker says or gives you warranty, there is a minimum of three year period, where if you as a consumer can prove that uh, the product is faulty, like it's a manufacturing error. And they stated that they made a boo-boo, basically, themselves, so that wasn't hard to prove. Problem was, they still wanted you to pay for it, so there was no warranty, they ignored Swedish consumer laws. So I got kind of pissed, and um, yeah, yeah, I got to talk to the support, uh, which was also in Swedish. Back then, the companies I actually had, you know, Support in every nation usually, and uh, we basically agreed to not do business anymore. And the thing is, I since I researched this board, 
that's basically what other people have said too. Like Soltec basically is like, okay, then let's not do business. So they, they, they were kind of scammy. So I ended up buying Epox board and Selenia board. And uh, I didn't like the board anyway because it had real big issues. Uh, Prime 95 wouldn't even run more than six hours uh, out of the box. Stock, everything stock. If on the Epox board, there wasn't an issue at all. Uh, it couldn't run Red Alert 2 because it would just give an crash out an error. Ended up selling the board with the CPU for the price of the CPU. Uh, retail price with everything disclosed to the new owner and he was like no nah, I'm gonna use it for like an HTPC and a projector it's not a problem I don't care about Red Alert 2 and I don't care about you know this and that and stability it's like whatever movie is longer than six hours so it's shorter than six hours something like that so uh, ended up selling it but he ended up regretting it too because apparently the ADP was so buggy that there were blue dots uh, when you decoded movies no matter a graphics card so that was kind of annoying, but you know, what you do not do? Like I basically sent the board with the CPU, so with that disclosed, and we agreed on that. So there was a lot of problem with that board. Uh, they also cheated with the bus. So what Soltec did with the bus was that they, um, if you set the bus in the BIOS, as you would expect to do on any motherboard today, and even back then on a lot of board, you would expect that what you set is what you get, but that wasn't the case. What happened was, uh, if you set 133 MHz or 100, which was basically every CPU, like the Durons used, used 100 back then and the Atlas used 266, the 333 and 400 buses were still uh, not uh, available. So if you set 133 MHz, you got 136. And if you set uh, 100, you got 101, I think, or 102, something like that. Maybe it was 103, but you, you didn't get 100. Uh, and that was using uh, the BIOS, the jumper-free feature, as it was called back then. Wasn't happy with that whole. So, um, from my testing, if I set 132 or 99, I got the correct ones. I got 132 or 99. Well, I couldn't set 199, I could set 101, for example. Uh, and if I set 134, I got 134, and so on. So everything was correct except 133 MHz and, 100 and, and 100. So I tested it with the non jumper free settings, basically using a jumper block on the board, and that worked as expected 133 setting equal 133. And for me, using two RAM sticks back then, like you needed basically overvolting the memory to 2.8, which is uh, fine to run three sticks at 130 MHz. But if you run 136, like you would get memory errors all the time, prime 95 fault, so that wasn't stable. So it was actually a real issue for me to actually try to get the port the system to run initially before I figured it out. But my, actually, my, my first real like scratch built computer was a big bit annoying. So when I figured uh, the whole bus thing out, I actually posted it on like a big Swedish forum and people confirmed it and it kind of became news if I recall. Uh, Soltec made like this uh, claim that oh it was a bug and they so, so they patched it out, fixed it basically. But uh, the thing is you don't make something like that by mistake because it actually takes extra code. You, you, you have to first check what the user puts in in the BIOS so let's call it variable the FSB so if FSB equals 133 then that's what they're gonna set but if you so, so you can check like say 100 to 200 and you set that variable but if you now want to make it so that if someone sets 133 but only 133 or 100 you want that to be say 133 should equal 136 and 100 should equal 103 if you actually want that, you have to have an extra statement, an extra one for each to check that. You also have to have some code to actually write back the wrong values you're writing back in the BIOS 133, not 136. So the user doesn't get the, the, the clue they need to figure out what's going on. It was obviously just horse shit that they made a boo-boo. Uh, what, the reason they actually did this, and other manufacturers apparently did it too to some extent, was to get on the like like get the, the award of like the fastest motherboard because um, back then motherboards actually made a difference mostly due to chipset and maybe some bias tweaks and stuff like that but uh, 
yeah, it made more of a difference than today because today everything is integrated into your CPU. Sheeting, getting you know the bus up like up to two percent, would give you about a two percent performance uplift compared to the competition if they didn't sheet. So that was why they did it. The problem is like like in my case, it just caused a lot of instability. And even then the board was crap, but it wasn't as unstable. Could at least post the thing. So yeah, their support being crap and their product being crap. I don't miss Soltec going out of business, let's put it that way. This is what happens when you don't remove the caps in time. They start to boil. But they were already pops, so that's not it. You can see there were pop before, I think it might be this one that is going smoky smoky. But anyways, these caps were very dead. So we can clearly see the electrolyte here, so we've got some cleaning to do here, that's for sure. This particular board is actually, it's based on the KM, uh, KM400. So it actually has uh, VGA out. So the difference there is really only the VGA out from what I read uh, compared to the KT400. So it's actually not really a downside. This means I could run this without the graphics card because it has one built in. And it's uh, probably Unichrome based or like initially S3 based. Because if I could recall we have bought that. Uh, I do have a VIA board uh, with like an in integrated C3 CPU and Unichrome graphics. And from what I read, this is also Unichrome based, which is in turn based on S, like the Savage 4, I think, ST Savage 4. So this board should, uh, well, it does officially support 333 MB bus and the same for memory. Probably too quick there because uh, the, the actual plane, like the real copper plane, is on the other side. That's why I have the board heater. It's when the copper plane is on the opposite side of where you have your iron, you get problems with the uh, solder not melting all the way through. A very small cap up in, up between the like the USB and stuff here, and the serial port. Not too bad as board to the solder caps. It's, uh, with the board heater, this is, was a fairly easy board. Some board can be really annoying even even with a board heater. Uh, maybe the small size helps, but might also not be that much copper in this board compared to some other boards. That's all the caps out of the board. So now we can clean it up. We have to try to clean up all of this uh, before we add some new caps. I'm gonna try and clean the board from old electrolyte that had leaked out. So I have uh, isopropanol alcohol or IPA and some electronic cleaner, some uh, Q-tips and brushes and stuff here. I have no idea hard, how hard this actually is stuck to the board and if it's corroded or anything. I'm just gonna throw some IPA over here. Begin with that. Just let it. Uh, do some work. Seems like the worst has to come off with the, the tweezers. Just using the side of them to, like, trying to knock it off. I don't, I don't want to scratch the board. It's really stuck on there, the electrolyte. But uh, we want to see what's under the caps as long as it's clean to the point where it doesn't affect functionality. 
and uh, I would say it's clean enough and we've got most of the gunk around the caps too I don't think we can do much about the discoloration of the white surfaces here in the print but we won't see that so. that will have to do I think Let's uh, start by adding some caps to the CPU VRM. So I'm gonna start with the 12 volt uh, caps here for the 12 volt rail. So I rated at 16 volts and 1500 microfarads originally. I didn't have 1500, but I had 1800. So I'm gonna use that. So I'm gonna use my biggest tip here again because it will retain the most heat so the biggest tip you can get away with usually might seem counterintuitive but uh, smaller tip will cool off faster when you touch the working surfaces There's obviously a practical limit to how big a tip can be, but this works most of the time. Otherwise, I usually go by with a two and a half, two point four millimeter here. So it's uh, about half this size. So next up are the actual V-Core caps that are rated at 3300 microfarads and 6.3 volts originally. And I had exactly six of these. I actually had allocated four of them to another motherboard, but that is not in like immediate need of recap as far as I know. I ordered some new ones, but uh, gonna use these ones that I have. I do technically have some good ones on a broken motherboard that I tried to fix, but it uh, never really worked out. I had too many issues. So all these caps I'm putting on right now are uh, Panasonic FR series, so this is the low ESR caps and uh, they have a few different versions in, like in the same series. These are probably the best ones because uh, they should be from that order I made last time uh, for my Athlon MP and uh, things like that, I actually think this is from that. I picked the best ones for that. Just adding some Amtec flux in. So the cap list for this board is on our Discord server, but I'm gonna show it on the screen anyway. 
I probably forgot to mention that when I started this, so I'm gonna put it up on the screen if you want to use it. To buy caps if you have the same board. This should be all the caps now, I think. I'm gonna have to double check, but uh, yeah. Figure you can do some measurements on the caps. I do expect, like if you set it to diode mode, I do expect it to beep on the VRMs because they tend to do that to have uh, the way they work. You do get some, uh, you have a low resistance, but they also have very low V voltage. So if you do the math on it, it's like uh, marginal, the power that goes through, is, that leaks through is marginal. So see here let's measure the big ones incoming 12 volts see what we have on that yeah. I'm basically shorting up the caps so that's fine and then we got the actual VRM side and it beeps, but if you set it to ohms only, so I don't have to hear the speaker. I should, uh, we saw it before, but uh, around 32 and rising. So that if you do the math, 33, uh, sorry, 33 uh, ohms and uh, whatever vehicle you have, like 165 would be normal for a Barton, normal Barton, it comes out so almost nothing. So that's pretty normal. You can measure before and after your recap board if you're unsure. But yeah, actually on the VRM side you do get that. So it's not a short, it's uh, as intended. So. Do we have any memory caps? So I don't think this is like any short or anything like that on this board. So yeah, I think uh, clean up, then we can test it. The board is out of the oven after some drying for about two hours. So I think it came out pretty nice. So the new caps installed here. I don't think you can tell that there was a leak there, but anyway. So only left thing left to do is install the heatsink uh, CPU. I did grab an Atron XP Palomino uh, 1700 plus. I'm not sure this one works. I don't see why it wouldn't, but uh, I can't remember testing it. Also grabbed a stick uh, of RAM, PC3200, 256 megabytes. Uh, I mostly have 3200 and 512 meg sticks, so this is kind of like, if it burns, it burns. Also figure Palomino like this is probably like a 68 watt part or something like that. It will put the VFMs under some stress. You can actually see that things holding up. Um, there shouldn't be a problem with the power supply since we're running off 12 volts on this one. Yes, that's it. Ready for testing.
we are ready to try this. I'm gonna check power here. Power is off, power is on. Let's see here, I think this is power. And something is happening. Hasn't exploded yet. And we've got blue light and it works. 17 plus to uh, 256 pick of RAM. Actually using the onboard graphics right now, so you can actually see if that works. Uh. Okay, did I connect this wrong or something? Hmm, weird. Anyway, I either pushed the wrong button or I had to reconnect the keyboard, but uh, after that it works. So that's good, a good sign, I haven't blown anything up yet. So what I'm actually gonna do now, as we're in the BIOS here and the system is running, is that I'm gonna add a GeForce 4MX here instead of the graphics card to have some actual graphics performance. And I'm gonna hook up uh, the hard drive I have over here so we can boot Windows. Uh, and also we can record everything uh, with the capture card. So now we're posting here again. And as you can see, I had a E4 4 card. So boot menu, let's see here. Run set up. Yes. But I'm not worried with uh, the cooler I have. It's an 80 millimeter fan on that here. I was gonna set the voltage, I just want to figure out what this thing can do. 185, so basically 10, 100 millivolts over stock. That's interesting. And this can do Veeam, that's an always nice. This thing is locked, so. And let's see, BIOS 0411.14. Yeah, let's see and see if Windows will launch or not. And yeah, it's gonna do a lot of this because uh, I had an M42 board before, the DFI one. We tested the CPU on. I'm not gonna blame Soltec, but uh, I'm blaming Soltec on that one. Classic uh, Soltec bullshit. Fuck you again. We are in Windows 2000 because uh, Windows 98 was uh, a bit of a pita. Uh, I had a lot of problems with my graphics cards. Uh, couldn't get the drivers to actually work on uh, my fastest E44 MX440. Uh, it did work on two slower ones, but uh, that's not fun. And. Uh, yeah, there were just general instability problems and uh, drive problems, installing software didn't work, so ended up taking a spare hard drive and installing Windows 2000 instead, because that's more suitable for a motherboard like this, 2000 or XP. So everything is working now, it seems, and I can run CPC here, because I want to check out, here we have the CPU then, I mount to a 1700 plus, so where is that? It's over here, yeah. That's the correct clock, and let's see if we can uh, mainboard. So yeah, Soltec. And the model, I don't know, there seems to be some, that's not the actual model number. But anyway, it doesn't matter because the chipset is correct, KM400. Memory, 256 meg, as I put in, Got running at effectively 233 megahertz. And then we should have some graphics here, but uh, we don't. But anyway, I installed uh, my fastest ADP card I have spare right now, which isn't much, but it's a 128-bit uh, 4MH DDR GeForce MX440, so it's it's like a fast GeForce 2 card. So we can run something on it, say Trimark 2000. Custom benchmark, let's see what happens.
As you can see, trader mark 2000 ran just fine. The score is uh, CPU limited because the card uh, at stop clocks uh, will do around 9000 points uh, on a faster board than CPU. But uh, the important thing is that the motherboard seems to be working fine under Windows 2000. After getting the board up and running, I had a few problems because I wanted to test Windows 98 on it. It's a newer board. The chipset is from 2002, the BIOS is from 2004. But it should run uh, Windows 98 because uh, there are drivers for the VIA chipset for Windows 98. It's even on the CD that I got with it. And I have all the VIA Hyperion and VIA 41 drivers and stuff like that. But I didn't really like my older E44 MX44 there. It's a proper 128 bit uh, 4 MHz DDR card. So it performs like a fast GeForce 2. It also didn't like the GeForce 2 MX400. Both of these refused to work with the drivers. It would just corrupt the, the actual boot screen for Windows 98 and crash out. These two are newer. This is uh, also a GeForce 440 MX8X AGP. And this is basically the same, but it's called MX8, uh, MX4000. These two will install the drivers and work. But I had problems like installing software where the screen would just go corrupt and hang. Eventually I gave up on Windows 98 after trying uh, reinstalling, trying different versions of the VIA drivers, things like that. Different, uh, different everything. So I installed Windows 2000 as you saw and that run, runs fine. And I did use this card, so no more corruption and problems with that. So it uh, seems to not be a very good board if you for some reason want to use uh, Windows 98 and possibly DOS. I haven't uh, like give DOS a spin that much. It's obviously DOS is obviously support with Windows 98, but I didn't try like any DOS games or anything. But uh, the board is pretty nice still with the uh, 12 volt power here, and uh, we got the Athlon XPM 2400 Plus with the motherboard. So for around $11 for the motherboard and CPU and another one five for shipping, I think it was a really good deal. So I think that's it for this time and thank you for watching and have a nice day. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public LANs when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels, where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.